thank you so much for coming today. Uh, this is um, our third annual uh, Kickstart Your Humanitarian Careers Fair. Um, we've had a really great range of organisations come along um, and we wanted to conclude the evening with a bit of a question and answer session um, with two uh, fabulous humanitarian uh, trainers and practitioners. Um, so we're going to start with some um, introductions uh, and then we're going to really open it up to any questions that you might have for either uh, myself, Stephen or Richard. Um, but I just really quickly first wanted to touch on um, what this event is and who Red R are. I promise I won't plug uh, Red R throughout this whole presentation, but um, just to quickly say that Red R is a um, capacity building organisation that really focuses on capacity building within the humanitarian sector. Um, so that's everything from training courses, um, simulations, coaching, mentoring, um, and we also run two fantastic professional development programs. Um, our membership program for experienced humanitarians, um, of which Richard is, is one, and also our affiliate scheme, which is really targeted towards those looking to move into the um, humanitarian sector. And I know that there are a few affiliates in the, in the crowd today. Um, so my name is Ellie Minari. Um, I'm the membership coordinator. Um, I primarily look after those two schemes I just touched on, the membership program and the affiliate scheme. Um, and my background is not as a technical specialist, but it is instead in um, sort of HR recruitment um, and, and uh, managing humanitarian deployments. But I'm not the interesting one on this panel. Um, so I'm first of all going to uh, get Stephen Blakemore, um, a Red Art Associate Trainer um, and humanitarian consultant to speak a little bit, just to introduce himself and speak a little bit about his experience. Thank you very much, Elliot, and good evening, everybody, and thanks very much for, for coming. It is quite disconcerting that these four, three or four rows at the front are empty, so if anybody at the back would like to, to come forward, it would, uh, I think, enable us to have more of a conversation. As Ellie says, my name's Stephen. I've been working uh, as a freelance um, uh, consultant and trainer and facilitator uh, for about the last 15 years now, um, and it followed a, a, a period of 10 years when I worked for VSO, Voluntary Service Overseas. And when I left VSO after 10 years, I thought I just needed a little bit of time to work out what I'm going to do next. And I'm still in that time working out what I'm going to do next. It just happens to be 15 years later. Along the way, things have happened, which I'll tell you about. Uh, uh, going back before uh, before I joined VSO, I really wish there'd been a kickstart your <laughs> humanitarian career because I, I, there was nothing like that for me. And in many ways, I'm I'm sort of grateful for that because I think everything I learned in those first few years, even before I worked for VSO when I was doing volunteer jobs and temping and and uh, uh, th this and that, everything I learned then I'm using now. And actually, I prob it's probably more important. So all the things that I learned about, uh, you know, being part of a team, about, you know, being, uh, trying to be innovative and creative and finding solutions and everything I learned, you know, trying to, you know, get to grips of IT, everything I learned about, you know, project planning, that's, that's all uh, important now and much more important, I think, than my, you know, training and facilitation skills, which, uh, which uh, you know, came later. Um, I got into to the sector uh, through VSO, but I'd worked in the civil service before then. I'd, I'd worked for eight years as a, as a civil servant, trying to find a passport out of the out of, uh, department and into overseas work, which I wanted to do. And there were various ways in which I could do that through, through the civil service, through, through uh, you know, what is now Department for International Development or through diplomatic service. But I really did want to work for a, a voluntary organization. I was very keen to, um, uh, to find that opportunity and, and, and VSO uh, gave that to me. And uh, that's really when I, I sort of brushed up on the skills that I use today as a trainer, both as an as associate trainer to, to Red R and also uh, for a range of other uh, organizations. And I, I think, you know, my career planning is probably not, you know, you're, you're probably taking a more deliberate uh, steps than me, but I think, you, you know, it's much the same way as I go shopping. I just see what's on the shelves and take it and, and use it and then go back if there's something else that I, that I need. And, and uh, that's worked for me. And I think it might work for some of you as well. Perfect, thank you, Stephen. Um, Richard, I'll get you to introduce yourself. If you want to just bring that microphone a little bit closer. Can you all hear us clearly? Great. 
Great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sound okay for everyone? So, good evening. Uh, really great to be here. And um, uh, it's a real privilege, actually. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, and thanks very much for Red R for asking uh, uh, us along here tonight. Um, so, my name is Richard Luff. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about my journey, um, but my journey to get to, to where I am now, here talking to you, uh, giving you some advice, is, is really very uh, an atypical route. So it's quite unrepresentative. So not necessarily one that uh, a route that you'd be able to follow. Um, back in 1988, when I first started doing humanitarian work, things were very different then, uh, and. On my sort of way here, I perhaps, perhaps I sort of, um, I smiled when Stephen said he had a, a something like a, a shopping approach and sort of picked, picked things what he want, uh, that he wanted. So for me, I've been quite opportunistic in a way. I've, I've had four sort of what I, five, five proper jobs in my life. I've, I've resigned from four of those without knowing quite what I was going to go on to. And something's come up. Uh, I went to Ethiopia um, in order to to see what would happen and made connections there. And I went to Nepal some years later and ended up uh, working in Nepal for a time. So my motivation, uh, really this comes from me, for me very strongly from my elder brother who was, uh, he was responsible for the, the Vietnamese settlement programs, so the Vietnamese boat people. Some of you may know about that, have heard about that. So he was responsible for that program. And he was re he's really my inspiration. Um, and when I started my civil engineering degree, um, I was wondering what I would, would do. And I went along to a talk in the Institute of Civil Engineers. And there was someone from VSO, an engineer from VSO, and someone from Red R. So there's this Red R theme coming, uh, coming out for me right from the outset. And I listened to those two people speak, and I was really inspired and thought, this is the route I will follow. <coughs> And that's what I declared to my friends subsequently. So I graduated in 1982. I started working for a civil engineering contractor. Um, and then in 1985, I was accepted on the Red R register for refugees and then had my first opportunity to work abroad in 1988 for Oxfam. In between times, I continued to work um, for contractors in the UK as well as traveling abroad. So I worked there for six months did a second contract with Oxfam in Namibia, and that was a, a returnee resettlement program. That was the time of sort of uh, peace and reconciliation in Namibia in 1990. And then I decided I really need to go back to university and, and actually pay more attention this time, because I hadn't really paid that much attention during my engineering degree. Um, so I did a master's in uh, public health engineering uh, to sharpen up my, uh, my sort of under technical understanding. and then. I worked for Oxfam for many years, from, uh, from 1991 up until 2001, in various assignments in different places around the world. Um, then I took a year and a half secondment into DFID, the so Department for International Development, so working for the UK government. And that was in a more generic role rather than a, a technical role as such. Uh, that came to an end, and I came back to Oxfam. I had, at that point, resigned from my job in Oxfam as a technical job, and then applied for and was successful in getting a management job, an overall coordination management job. Um, then that took me up until 2007, um, by which time there was restructuring going on in Oxfam. I became the architect of my own jobs, uh, my own job ending. Um, and then I decided that was the right time for, to leave. And at that point I went to Nepal. And there I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time. I was being, I was actually trekking in the mountains when uh, my wife got a phone call from UNICEF saying, well, there's, we'd like to interview, interview you for a job. So I started working for UNICEF in Nepal for several years in a regional, a regional job. After that, we came back to the UK, and since, since 2011, I've worked as an independent consultant for different organisations, NGOs, Red Cross, uh, for also for the UN, different UN agencies. So that's what I continue to do now. 
Um, I just thought it might be useful to share some of the characteristics that I, I, I bring that I think have helped me along the way. Um, so there's something about being opportunistic and resourceful, being flexible. Uh, I'm quite determined in my nature, clear, but I'm also someone who's very collaborative and flexible and, and adapt, adaptable. I think also it's proved to be really important for me along the way to be respectful, listening to uh, people and engaging with people, the people that uh, we're working on behalf of, those affected by crisis, but also a government, civil society organisations, other team members. So being respectful is a key quality f for me and it's something I would, um, I think we all need to bring to our work. Just a couple of thoughts about the future. Things are always changing. Uh, and there's just some, some sort of flags that might be worth you thinking about. I mean, we've, the, the, the world of humanitarianism is, there's, a, there's what's called the localization agenda. So that's something to do with um, more emphasis on national local actors. Uh, we don't know yet what impact that will have on the extent of international uh, relief humanitarian workers required. There's something there. There's a second big thing I think that's coming up is the rise of sort of cash programming. So cash programming as opposed to specific sector programming. So it's another change that's starting to build up. The third, I think, big change, big shift, this is progressive, not uh, uh, instant, is increasing urbanization. So within urbanization we're probably requiring a higher levels of technical skill than we may have had to employ uh, in, in years gone by. And finally, I, I think it's also true to say that complexity ever more increasing. And I think that it's, you need to be aware that frustrations and bureaucracy are very much part of an increasing part of this. The dramatic shifts I've seen over the last 30 years in terms of this so I think being prepared to engage with that <coughs> bureaucracy and being prepared to accept the frustrations even when we're in the midst of doing so life-saving work. So those, those four points might be worth bearing in mind, thinking about changes that are coming. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Richard and Stephen both. Um, so now it's over to you. Um, if any of you have any uh, burning questions or anything that you'd like to discuss, um, feel free to direct it to anyone on the panel. You can just ask it more generally and we can um, give it our best shot to answer. Um, as you notice, we've only got two microphones. So what I might get you to do is just stand up and sort of shout your question out. And, um, and I'll repeat it back for anyone watching this on YouTube later on so that they can hear it clearly. Um, so would anyone like to be brave and start? Obviously not, because I'm in a room of Fritz. <laughs> yeah, at the back. <laughs> I'll do it. And so I'll just introduce myself. I'm a student at LSE. I study um, global politics. And thank you so much for the panel. A great experience, great insights. I actually want to address my question specifically to Fritcher. I think it's extremely brave the way you went about entering the field, literally. And I hope to do the same for myself. But I'm just wondering if you can have any kind of, yeah, any insight or any advice Specifically, I mean, you've already touched upon the characteristics you think are useful. Is there anything else that would, yeah, any, any, any advice you'd have to prepare yourself for working in the field to perhaps make yourself attractive? And do you guess it's important to already have some sort of line of communication with NGOs or um, organizations in the field? Or do you really think even now today you can just go and, and build that network world there? Thank you. So the question is whether there's anything you can do to help uh, prepare or what steps you take to start um, applying for those field positions. Great, thank you. Um, I guess it feels as though it's less possible to do that now. Nonetheless, I think that when there is a major crisis, so the right place at the right time, it does play a part. Um, I think in terms of preparation, obviously, going on uh, training courses, orientation. Um, I, for me, back in the 80s, I did go to Ethiopia off my own back just to sort of demonstrate willing and I was quite 
opportunistic and an approach red R and, and so forth. So I think that being, being propositional um, is important. Propositional, prepared, right place, the right time. I think I would add to that is, you know, really understand the context and the, the country. And I don't mean just, you know, Lonely Planet or Wikipedia, but understand what's going on, understand how people live, understand the social dynamics, the political dynamics, un understand the, you know, the stresses and strains that the ordinary people face in their lives because that's an insight that you that you're unlikely to get just from um, you know from what you read in the in the news and i was struck recently uh, a couple of weeks ago a report came out i think from care international of the the 10 hidden disasters the 10 hidden emergencies in the world so they looked back over 2017 and, and uh, looked at the news coverage that different um, crises and different disasters, man-made and natural, was getting. And then they, they listed 10 that, that figured very little in the news. They're either unreported or, or underreported. Um, and uh, because they're unreported or underreported, they're underfunded as well. And, and um, uh, that's a challenge not only for the organisations that are trying to work there but also for the local people who are at the centre of, of the crisis. But they tell a story, yeah, they tell a story not only about those countries and, and those crises but also about the, the world and about humanitarianism and about disasters and about crisis. So seek out these, these reports, you know, watch uh, Unreported World on, on Channel 4 or Dispatches and things because they'll the, the media is, is quite fickle, actually, you know, it'll, it'll follow a story while, while it's news, so while there are new things happening, and then when there are no more new things happening, there'll be another new story, and they'll pick that up, and then stuff just falls off the radar. So, Nepal, you know, we've both been to Nepal, Rich has worked in Nepal, what's happening in Nepal now? You know, there's, there's still a lot happening, um, you know, in regards to, to recovery uh, from, from the earthquake in, in 2015. So find out, read about it, and equip yourself with, with knowledge and understanding. Um, uh, and that will really help you, I think, when you find yourself in these places, because you'll have a much greater insight into to what's going on. Great, thanks. And I think just to um, add to that as well, obviously I've just got to touch on training, given that Red R do so much, but there is some really fantastic learning you can do also around sort of humanitarian coordination and the humanitarian system and um, even just familiarising yourself with the different agencies and actors involved I think can be really um, helpful and useful as you start to explore these things. Um, so whether that be uh, training in person um, with an organisation like Red R or even if you're looking at sort of online opportunities um, through sites like Disaster Ready um, which have a whole host of online courses that can be a really good place to start. Um, thank you. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. Hey, sorry, you just briefly mentioned um, the impact that the media has on covering the process. That's the research area I'm looking at. And I was just kind of wondering what you personally thought were the best ways to kind of track the influence that media does have specifically on fundraising. Um, because there are so many hidden ones that essentially mean fundraising doesn't get there. But it's really hard to track those channels, um, I'm finding, currently. Uh, and sorry, your name? Oh, sorry, Hannah. Hannah, thank you, thank you, Hannah. Well, you probably, you know, you can probably tell us more than I can tell you as, as you're looking at it. I, I don't, nothing specific comes out. I need a, a moment to reflect on that. I don't know if Richard, anything to say around the, the media and their impact on, on fundraising? Well, um, yeah, it's incredibly complex uh, matrix of different funding sources. You've obviously got the um, the major donor contributions. You've can uh, the OCHA financial tracking service is one source of data. But then um, and in the UK, where you've got civil society contributions through the Disasters Emergency Committee, like for the response in Bangladesh at the moment, that's trackable. But where you've got increasingly as civil society in disaster affected countries, you know, the Indonesians or the tsunami affecting East, East Asia, Indonesia, uh, Sri Lanka, a lot of resources raised locally. So getting a me measure of that, systems aren't in place. 
increasingly, and it's sort of approaching two thirds of the amount of money in some disaster responses is, is basically remittances from uh, families of workers abroad. So it's a massively uh, complicated picture. So we've only got part of the, the sort of the picture, but that does show huge disparities in terms of amount given. So in the East Asian tsunami, I uh, can't remember the figures off the top of my head, and the Kosovo crisis, much higher r rates of sort of official donation compared to, say, the, the you know, the forgotten, the, the, the couple of decades of almost forgotten crisis in Congo. So we do know some things, we know quite a lot, but we've only got a part of the picture. Any thoughts, Stephen? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, Richard's right, and I, I, I think... Um, uh, there is a correlation, I think, between you know me media attention and, and funding. But as as Richard hints, it's a lot of the money isn't necessarily coming through through um, those channels. Um, uh, uh, but but I think yeah, I mean, going back to that sort of Care International report and and looking at some of the crisis. I mean, does anybody know what the number one underreported? humanitarian crisis is in the world today, the one that's had the least media attention. Any guesses which country we would be looking at? Where you probably, you know, if you're thinking about fundraising, I can't, I can't think of any instances where I've seen anybody raising <coughs> money. Well, Sudan actually is on the list. It's, it's one of the, the top ten, and not least because there are lots of sort of South Sudanese, you know, refugees. Hmm? Venezuela. Uh, I don't think Venezuela is on the list, but it is. It is certainly uh, unreported. Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine wasn't on the list, yeah. but that's not to say. Yemen. Yemen wasn't on the list. There has has been a bit of media attention on Yemen. It's a country where there, actually there's been a lot of media attention, but it just, it's just focused in the wrong place at the moment. And it's North Korea. It's the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, where it's estimated that some 70% of the population are food insecure um, at the moment. We have no access, and that makes it very difficult um, um, uh, to find out exactly what is going on and to, to, to bring assistance. So... Uh, you know, and then you, you go down that list and you'll, you'll find other countries and you'll think, wow, I, I, you know, Vietnam, I did not know. They had 10 huge storms last year and so many people, uh, you know, coupled with other, other you know, crises, make, making, again, putting people at risk, making them f food insecure. So I think one of the, going back to the sort of career aspect of the day, one of, one of the things that you, I think, can do, one of the things we can all do is raise awareness of what's happening in the world, get involved in, in campaigning and fundraising and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, talking to, 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 you know, media and whatever so that we can try and address the balance um, uh, a little bit and maybe that, that, you know, might help. And I also just think it's interesting. It just gives you a better picture of the world, particularly at a time when this, it's so hard to know what's truth and what isn't so and and you know to, to so you know do do search out stories it's it's very interesting great thank you any other questions no one that um oh sorry another one at the back um, I, know if I, can do it again, but I have a very brief one i'm just wondering because stephen mm. you got quite a lot of Gosh, um, well, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, Nepal, I first went to Nepal uh, to do, I mean, my, you know, I'm, I don't, if people ask me what I do, I would never say I'm an aid worker or a relief worker. I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm not that fortunate. I'm not that skilled. I, 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 you know, I, I, that's not my job. I go there. I do work with, you know, you know, local communities. We do training. We were train, training some of the, you know, country uh, uh, emergency teams in various places, which is what I was doing in Afghanistan for for international uh, organisation there. Um, uh, so you know my understanding, my view, my perceptions of the country are, are skewed a little bit by 
by where I am and the job I'm doing and, and so on and so forth. Having said that, so Nepal, first of all, I mean, I, I first went to Nepal in 97. I was working for VSO and we, we, you know, we had a team in Nepal and we wanted to, to build their, uh, their skills a, a, a little bit. So we'd already started the localization agenda, I think, back um, you know, tw 20 years ago in, in, in VSO and taking all our, our training over, overseas. And I fell in love with the place then. Um, it's an amazing country. Put your hands up if you've been to Nepal. It's an amazing country, isn't it? Um, and, uh, you know, I've got to know people and, and I go back. I, it's probably the country I've been to most. Um, not so much for, for work, although I have, I have done a little bit of work there, but mostly just because I enjoy being there and exploring the, the, you know, the richness of, uh, of the culture and, and whatever. Um, and I think, you know, what's helped with that is just to get to know people there and not, you know, not stay in Tamil, which is the sort of touristy area of Kathmandu, but get out of the, uh, the city, get out of the valley, you know, get to know local people, accept those invitations, you know, stay with... Uh, you know, families and and uh, and find out the uh, the real the real Nepal. Um, when I first went, there were troubles in Nepal. You know, with the sort of Maoist uprising, and there were security and and safety issues, many of which I was unaware of. I was quite sort of you know green and naive in those days, and often went without any sort of security briefing, which is sort of. Uh, you know, uh, can't do anything these days unless you've, you know, had several security, you know, briefings. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I learned so much. And I think, you know, one of the things that I've learned about the sector and getting a job and, and building a career or, or, or um, whatever it is, is it's all about learning. You know, every opportunity you, you have is a learning opportunity. And, and I think that's a, you know, that's a, precious thing and, and will, you know, always, always be the case. Afghanistan was slightly different. I've only been to Afghanistan once. I, I, I stayed in Kabul. It was impossible to go out of the, the, the hotel. We, we were restricted. We weren't able to move around. Um, we work with local staff, Afghanis, that have come from uh, around the country to be there for this training. They, it's a very rare opportunity for them. While we were there on the second night, a huge car bomb exploded not too far away from the hotel but much closer to the hotel that the local staff were staying in because they, they you know we were in a, a more you know luxurious hotel because you know it offered afforded us international staff more protection the local local staff weren't so their hotel was was quite severely damaged the you know windows were blown out and and so on and so forth and and there we were in in the uh, you know, our five-star hotel thinking, okay, what's happening? Are we going to stay in the country? Are we going to be evacuated out tomorrow? Can we continue with the, the training? You know, calls being made to various places around the world to see what, you, you know, who's going to make a decision on this. Meanwhile, um, all these, you know, local staff are packing their bags, getting their, you know, notebooks together and, and turned up for the training. And so, you know, this, welcome to Carpool, this is us. And I was moved by the sort of resilience um, uh, that was demonstrated to me then and, and, and since and in, and in other places that I, I, I've worked. And I think that's, you know, you talk about what motivates us, you know, I think that's, you know, one of the things that motivates me is, is you know, by quirk of fate, I'm born where I am and, and uh, uh, in the life that I, that I lead and, and uh, other people um, less, less fortunate, though they might not, you know, think of it that way, but the resilience, you know, blows you away sometimes that people demonstrate. Anything to say on your adventures in... Well, a couple of anecdotes about what it's like. I, when I was in Afghanistan during the time the Taliban were present in, in control of uh, Kabul and most of the country, um, I remember the, the male members of uh, the start of the organization I was working for, um, the national staff, being just on, on the verge of crying that their wives and their daughters were imprisoned under the Taliban. That was something very striking. 
In um, Azerbaijan in 1993, uh, going to a fat, this is the second time we've been to this family, and this uh, family had been wonderful hosts the, when I'd been there five weeks previously. Uh, we'd got to know them because um, the, the guy was a contractor helping to build latrines. We were invited back, but this time uh, the, the front line of the conflict was on the doorstep and I, I was invited back to the family and they were planning to leave the house the next day. Everything was packed up and there was this, the transformation from this wonderful hospitable family to a family on the verge of having to abandon their house and their life, fleeing from the conflict that was about to engulf them and uh, incredibly moving, humbling experience and I felt so gutted that the, there were these people um, facing this. One of the things about working in, I found that working in water and sanitation and side of things, it's very much dealing with sort of, in general, large numbers of people. Uh, compare that to, say, doctors or nurses who have much more one-to-one -one relationships. So I found that in my time it's, it's not been that common where I've had that that one-to-one -one sort of contact. And one other anecdote perhaps in, um, in a country that we've mentioned before, I won't mention again now, so you can probably guess where it is. It was a country in which we were accompanied everywhere by government minders. Everything that we were told was utter falsification to the extent of when there was no electricity, asking why this was, being told that it was a temporary breakdown, asking why women were collecting water from the streams because clearly the water pipes weren't working, told that those women shouldn't be collecting water there and of course the pipes worked, everything was fine. So just a complete fabrication, a lie. So that was bizarre and how do you work with that situation? Thank you both. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Um, my name is Lushat. Um, I'm originally from Turkmenistan. Um, my question about have you had any um, cases with negative publicity? So in the humanitarian sector, sometimes you have uh, media reporting negative facts about what's going on in the country. And uh, how did you? So the question is around negative publicity and how you deal with that issue. Uh, personally, I, I, I don't. I mean, I don't know whether your, your question is in, informed a little bit by what's happening or what, you know, uh, uh, in the media at the moment. Um, there have been stories around sort of aid worker, you know, behaviour and, and um, uh, 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 the piece that came out about Oxfam staff in, in uh, Haiti. I, I've not encountered, I've not encountered anything other than, than uh, you know, grace, gracious hospitality where, wherever I, I've been. I, I've, uh, I've not encountered it from other uh, 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 people I've met, be they in, in, in government or, or whatever, I think on the whole, perhaps I've been been very lucky. Um, we haven't had that that sort of negative, um, you know, um, publicity, whether it's from from our media, from local media, or, or whatever. And I think, uh, and I think, you know, part of why that's the that's the case is we've always tried to. to to be as inclusive as, as possible. So, you know, we did a lot of training with, with Red R actually in, um, uh, in Darfur, in, in Sudan. And, and um, in a way you have to, to always include the government and always talk to people what is, uh, you know, about what is going on. And you always accept that, you know, some of the places on your training courses will be, uh, you know, need to be reserved for, for government officials. And, you know, that's, that's part of how, how it works and how business is done. And I think, you know, I'm always interested in people and talking to people. And if you take it a step further and you, you know, you take tea or coffee and have a conversation with, with people, then you find some of the, the sort of barriers, the, some of the, 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 you know, the soapboxes that people stand on, some of the, the sort of um, 
you know, uh, you know, the, the authorities and whatever disappear, and you're just two men, or you may be two women, just having a, a, a conversation. And I think that's, I think, the, the, the there's something in it, in, in there, is actually the more that people know about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and. And the more we listen, the more we get their participation, the more we involve people at every level and in, in our decision making and our activities and our be it training or, or be it be it you know uh, wash or whatever. I think the more you know, you know effective it will be and, and the more more positive the the um, response, um, be it in the media or, or elsewhere. Richard, I don't know. You might have had a different experience. And I'm just wondering how we hold the media to account at times. Um, and next to Gulshay, yes, I think there's another question. Hello, uh, my name is Shobhit. I'm a student at King's. Uh, my question is to Richard, uh, because you work in shelter. Uh, so my question is that uh, how do you reduce the time uh, that people have to spend in temporary shelter and increase it? to the reconstruction phase, like put in more effort in the reconstruction phase. Because what happens a lot is that people end up staying more than necessary in the in temporary shelters. So that thing, and uh, that's also one thing that's happening in Nepal, if you've been following the reconstruction program, that the government's national uh, rural housing uh, reconstruction scheme has not been fully implemented still after the two years of the uh, earthquake. Uh, but even if uh, contractors are, have started there, so the question is around um, how we move people from temporary shelters um, and move into the reconstruction phase. Richard. Great, okay. Um, if we, I think if we cast our eyes back to probably about 10, 15 years ago, so and I think that the, the response to the Haiti earthquake was a bit of a watershed. Um, we've, we've now, the shelter sector to, to some greater extent uh, certainly natural disasters have moved more towards what they call supporting self-recovery. So that's uh, supporting uh, households, communities rebuild their own houses with tools, uh, with maybe artisans, uh, so skilled people to uh, help them build um, with sort of information about how to build, rather than uh, contracting and building houses for people. So that's been one big shift that we've seen under this supporting self-recovery. However, you remember I talked about sort of the urbanizing world, the, the built environment in urban areas is much more complex and the, the sort of the standards of housing and the building materials and so that's much more out of reach than say traditional sort of more simple rural. So we've got, we've got two things that are sort of competing against each, each other, so working through that. Um, in terms of the yeah delivery, the the um, delivery of the, the government grants in Nepal, yeah, it's uh, well as some of you may be aware, the political process in Nepal has been quite uh, in flux since two thousand and eight, since the peace agreement. Uh, now it looks like there is much more stability since the elections in November. That should lend itself to things stabilising. So it could lend itself to actually enhancing those processes. What we know is where there's political uh, uncertainty, tension, that everything tends to be disrupted. Look here in Britain with Brexit, you know, everything's getting disrupted because of this. I mean, in Nepal, say, it, 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 people have said, communities have said, that the, the uh, commitments of the government to deliver those payments has been way overdue. So I think everyone can read that for themselves. Yeah, that doesn't help obviously support that's allocated, budgetary allocations, whether they're international or national, you know, need to be made in a timely fashion. Thank you. Um, I think I saw another hand go up over here. Yeah, just on the front. Yes, good evening. My name is Barbara. Um, I'm a psychotherapist and I am wondering if you could tell me something about language barriers and how we navigate those and perhaps how interpreters tend to be used. Yep, so a question about language barriers um, and uh, how you overcome those. I, I don't, I, have a, I speak a little bit of French, but not really enough to get on, uh, to get by with and, and have been quite lazy when it comes to learning languages and the 
older I got, the harder uh, I find it to, to learn languages. Um, and it's, it's a challenge. I mean, it's not so much a challenge for me, I think. It's more of a challenge for people that I'm, I'm working with, and I'm, I'm very aware of that. We have, uh, and sometimes do, use translators and uh, in, interpreters in, 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 in training and other work that I've done, and, and sometimes that works fine, sometimes it works less fine, sometimes, uh, you know, in particular contexts you're not quite sure what, what uh, uh, you know, what has been said and, and whether the messages are, are, are getting across uh, effectively. Um, I think it comes back to the relationships as, as well, you know, always taking time to sit down with, you know, if you have, a, if you have an interpreter them understanding you, understanding what you're talking about, understanding, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, the sort of, you know, principles and issues and models and frameworks on which you're discussing, because uh, some may not translate uh, very well. That's part of the, uh, you know, part of the deal. Um, uh, I, you know, I tend to think it's important to learn a little, at least a little bit of the language where you are, at least the sort of, uh, uh, you know, at a conversational level, to be able to greet people appropriately and thank people appropriately and ask for people, and I do try and try and do that, and and uh, and it goes a long way, I think, it, um, uh, to building those relationships. And I think it, uh, it often it just comes back to to relationship building, and that's one obvious tool that you have is to make that little little effort. Um. So it, we, often we're working with national staff, um, but being aware of, I think um, there are there are traps you can fall into. Um, you know, national staff will be sort of, to some extent, they'll be better off professional people. So, and we've clearly got consistent issues with uh, being able to talk to uh, women. This is something that we need to be mindful of. So finding uh, female translators. Uh, in terms of, say, for example, in Bangladesh at the moment, although the from the translators of Bangladesh is from Chittagong, they can uh, talk to some extent to the Rohingya refugees. Um, there's been uh, blockages issued that uh, identified there in terms of sort of the dialect being slightly different. And you know, you have to work hard to triangulate, don't you? If you're dependent upon you know, an individual, and it, it, at the start of a, a, a crisis, then it's, it's easy to, to sort of grab the people you can use for communication, but they're going to represent their views and not necessarily everyone. So being really mindful of that and finding other channels to triangulate, to check other translators, connecting particularly with, uh, with women are really important. Otherwise that voice gets lost. You know, it's the risk with translation. You lose a lot of voices. And then you, you lose the quality of your response. You're probably not going to get to the most vulnerable people. So real risks of having translators, just a single translator. Um, just another quick comment on language as well. I won't touch on the translation issue, um, but I know I've actually been having some conversations recently with some affiliates about this and the idea of whether or not you should um, commit to learning a language. Um, I think, especially for those looking to move into the sector, having another language can be incredibly useful, um, particularly at the moment, depending on where in the world you're working, French, Spanish, Arabic are incredibly useful languages. Um, but in terms of um, applying for, for roles or any you know, positions that you might be looking at that use that language, um, I completely agree with what Stephen said about um, you know, the difference it can make by just having some small conversational phrases. Um, but ultimately, most roles do require fluency. So if you are, for instance, working in West Africa, you would be expected to be fluent in French in order to take up that position. So I would very much encourage that everybody go out and learn French or you know, that everybody have another language, but just be aware at the, at the outset that that's the sort of commitment that you'll be looking for. Um, conversational French won't uh, open doors to positions in Francophone Africa. Um, it, yeah, from, from what I've seen anyway, and Richard and Stephen might disagree with me, but I think um, many of those roles will expect a sort of proficient, proficiency in that language so that you can work, conduct meetings, write reports um, in that. Thankfully for many of us, um, English still does tend to be uh, quite important globally. 
Great. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, right at the very back. Um, just a couple of questions about the sort of future of the sector. Um, like there's a, a move toward moving headquarters to the, to the global south, is one thing. Uh, and secondly, it seems a lot more money is going into, into governments, like trying to work with governments um, and, and encouraging them, like educating them the benefits of, for example, improved wash, rather than like sort of direct programming in the country. Um, and also sort of offsetting risk from international staff to having local targets. Um, well, it did touch upon the localization agenda as one of the sort of the trends, so I don't know what that will mean in terms of individuals like yourself, in terms of the ability of you to get, you know, the, the sheer numbers of people that's to be determined. Um, gosh, we're in a world in which. Um, there's a lot of crisis at the moment, so whilst there might be localization, there seems to be a lot more um, need, doesn't there? So um, the funding flows, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. I think there's always been sort of development funding, funding sort of bilateral to government to government. That's always been there. I can't comment on the sort of the trends over the last um, few decades. So, but, but clearly this localization agenda is rightly something that's uh, is is out there. So, but what it means for you, don't know. Can't comment. Uh, Richard mentioned a few observations around the sector. I'll just I'll just add one. I think you know the, there are there are new actors, if you like, new new organisations getting involved in humanitarian response now. Uh, that's changing things. I think there's a greater role for for mm -hmm. private sector um, than, than there has been in the past, whether that's at a, a you know, international global uh, level or, or at, a, at a local level as, as well, with more businesses getting involved. Um, uh, I think, you know, innovation, you know, technology uh, is playing a much, um, a, you know, a much greater role in humanitarian response and in, and in preparedness as well. So I think the sector as a whole is 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 evolving and, and changing at quite a you know at quite a pace um, now. It's much harder to 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 find it I think as as perhaps in the past. Great, thank you. Um, I'm conscious that we're running a little late this evening, um, but we might have time for just one or two more questions. I saw a hand go up in the middle uh, just a while ago. Yeah. So the question for everyone was how important uh, is a master's when you're looking to move into the, into the sector? I, I think it's much more important these days, certainly for UN agencies, for example. A master's is, is uh, it's one of the, it's, e it's either you um, have an X number of years experience or a master's. I think for other big international NGOs, um, the likes of, say, the children or CARE or Oxfam, I think a master's would also be highly desirable. So if you're in the market, if you want to be in the market, then have a get a master's. In my case, as I say, I, I sort of did the master's because I felt I better try and learn about the things I didn't really pay much attention to. So I was doing it for my own, if you like, to up my professional game. So there's, you know, the, don't, don't underestimate the value of the master's in itself for you to be able to deepen your understanding. And the thing that I really valued going back as a mature student is that I had, could reflect upon about seven years of working experience. So I saw everything in quite a different light. So it helps you in terms of having something on your CV, but it also can be a really powerful experience to, to reflect and take stock. And I, I think that one of the things I'll make a grand sweeping statement here, is that uh, it's probably a little bit of a tendency for sort of humanitarians to be predominantly reactive 
and therefore I think any opportunity to be reflective and to learn and to process is great and, and periods of study help with that. So it's a great reason to do it as well. Any last questions? Otherwise, okay, one last one down the very front. Hello, um, I'm Emily. Um, I'm in my final year of my undergraduate at the moment, and we're kind of looking into going into humanitarian type work. Um, both of you mentioned, or it was mentioned, the DSO and the DFID. Um, I was just wondering if you'd be able to tell me a bit more about um, kind of those organizations um, and your kind of experiences in them. Uh, it's, it's Emily, um, thank you. Um, no, <laughs> I left VSO uh, sort of 15 years ago, so I, I wouldn't want us to, to, to try and sec you know, guess the sort of organisation it, it, it is now. So I can imagine it's changed a lot uh, since I left. I, I, it was the best, I, you know, I wasn't a volunteer overseas, I worked on the staff. Team, I worked with, I met and, and stayed with many volunteers in some of our countries and talked to them about their experience, and it was clearly a, a, a very enriching and, and important experience that, that, and, uh, uh, that they had then. And I've met a few people in my travels that say, "Oh yes, I, you know, I did the SO a few years ago." So. So, you know, look at the website, talk to them, go to, to you know, a meet VSO evening or something and, and find out. And, and uh, I don't think you'll regret uh, at least finding out what, what they're doing because there, there's an opportunity. I know you mentioned uh, DFID as well. I know they have a graduate scheme. I don't know very much about it, but if, uh, you know, it's a slightly different path to take from working for a, you know, development organisation like, you know, VSO to working for a institutional donor like, you, you know, TIFID, um, but, you know, again, um, uh, worth finding out um, uh, information. Um, and also don't ig ignore all those other tiny, small organisations as, as well, be they here or, or, um, uh, or, or in, you know, elsewhere in Europe or, or around the world. I don't think this panel or even this, this room pretends to be representative of diverse, the diversity of the, the sector. Um, it is very diverse. There is so many different organisations, large and sport, small, different mandates and missions and visions and different perspectives on, on the world. And I just encourage you to just sort of give a lot of thought to, to the sort of organisation that you, you feel you want to be part of, the sort of work that you want to do, the sort of values that you hold dear and how they're reflected in in other organisations um, uh, and uh, um, expose yourself as I did to, to, to as many experiences as you as, as you can which may or may not include VSO or DFID or, or whatever and learn from those experiences they won't do anything but help you in the in the long run um, be opportunistic as, as you know Richard has, has said and um, um, and uh, yeah in, uh, enjoy yeah. Great, okay. Um, I think we might bring it to a wrap there then. Um, so I guess just uh, finally for me to say um, thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, I hope that you found it interesting. We'll send out some um, follow-up information tomorrow, but obviously uh, if you do have any questions from this evening, feel free to get in touch with somebody wearing a red R t-shirt and we can chat to you about it tonight. <laughs> Um, but also just a huge thank you to Stephen and Richard for sharing their insights into the sector um, and, uh, yeah, and sharing your experiences. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ellie. And thank, you. and thank you all for listening. <laughs>